The Voyage of the Beagle By Charles Darwin Preface I have stated in the preface to the first edition of this work, and in the zoology of the Voyage of the Beagle, that it was in consequence of a wish expressed by Captain Fitzroy, of having some scientific person on board, accompanied by an offer from him of giving up part of his own accommodations, that I volunteered my services, which received, through the kindness of the hydrographer, Captain Beaufort, the sanction of the Lords of the Admiralty. As I feel that the opportunities which I enjoyed of studying the natural history of the different countries we visited, have been wholly due to Captain Fitzroy, I hope I may here be permitted to repeat my expression of gratitude to him, and to add that, during the five years we were together, I received from him the most cordial friendship and steady assistance. Both to Captain Fitzroy and to all the officers of the Beagle I shall ever feel most thankful for the undeviating kindness with which I was treated during our long voyage. This volume contains, in the form of a journal, a history of our voyage, and a sketch of those observations in natural history and geology, which I think will possess some interest for the general reader. I have in this edition largely condensed and corrected some parts, and have added a little to others, in order to render the volume more fitted for popular reading, but I trust that naturalists will remember, that they must refer for details to the larger publications which comprise the scientific results of the expedition. The Zoology of the Voyage of the Beagle includes an account of the fossil mammalia, by Professor Owen, of the living mammalia, by Mr. Waterhouse, of the birds, by Mr. Gould, of the fish, by the Reverend L. Jennings, and of the reptiles, by Mr. Bell. I have appended to the descriptions of each species an account of its habits and range. These works, which I owe to the high talents and disinterested zeal of the above distinguished authors, could not have been undertaken, had it not been for the liberality of the Lord's Commissioners of Her Majesty's Treasury, who, through the representation of the Right Honourable the Chancellor of the Exchequer, have been pleased to grant a sum of £1,000 towards defraying part of the expenses of publication. I have myself published separate volumes on the structure and distribution of coral reefs, on the volcanic islands visited during the voyage of the Beagle, and on the geology of South America. The sixth volume of the Geological Transactions contains two papers of mine on the erratic boulders and volcanic phenomena of South America. Messrs. Waterhouse, Walker, Newman, and White, have published several able papers on the insects which were collected, and I trust that many others will hereafter follow. The plants from the southern parts of America will be given by Dr. J. Hooker, in his great work on the botany of the southern hemisphere. The flora of the Galapagos archipelago is the subject of a separate memoir by him, in the Alinean Transactions. The Reverend Professor Henslow has published a list of the plants collected by me at the Keeling Islands, and the Reverend J. M. Berkeley has described my cryptogamic plants. I shall have the pleasure of acknowledging the great assistance which I have received from several other naturalists, in the course of this and my other works, but I must be here allowed to return my most sincere thanks to the Reverend Professor Henslow, who, when I was an undergraduate at Cambridge, was one chief means of giving me a taste for natural history, who, during my absence, took charge of the collections I sent home, and by his correspondence directed my endeavors, and who, since my return, has constantly rendered me every assistance which the kindest friend could offer. Down, Bromley, Kent, June 9, 1845. Chapter 1 St. Iago Cape de Verde Islands after having been twice driven back by heavy southwestern gales, Her Majesty's ship Beagle, a ten-gun brig, under the command of Captain Fitzroy, R. North, sailed from Devonport on the 27th of December, 1831. The object of the expedition was to complete the survey of Patagonia and Tierra del Fuego, commenced under Captain King in 1826-1830, to survey the shores of Chile, Peru, and of some islands in the Pacific and to carry a chain of chronometrical measurements round the world. On the 6th of January we reached Tenerife, but were prevented landing, by fears of our bringing the cholera, 
The next morning we saw the sun rise behind the rugged outline of the Grand Canary Island, and suddenly illuminate the peak of Tenerife, whilst the lower parts were veiled in fleecy clouds. This was the first of many delightful days never to be forgotten. On the 16th of January, 1832, we anchored at Porto Praia, in St. Iago, the chief island of the Cape de Verde archipelago. The neighborhood of Porto Praia, viewed from the sea, wears a desolate aspect. The volcanic fires of a past age, and the scorching heat of a tropical sun, have in most places rendered the soil unfit for vegetation. The country rises in successive steps of tableland, interspersed with some truncate conical hills, and the horizon is bounded by an irregular chain of more lofty mountains. The scene, as beheld through the hazy atmosphere of this climate, is one of great interest, if, indeed, a person, fresh from sea, and who has just walked, for the first time, in a grove of coconut trees, can be a judge of anything but his own happiness. The island would generally be considered as very uninteresting, but to anyone accustomed only to an English landscape, the novel aspect of an utterly sterile land possesses a grandeur which more vegetation might spoil. A single green leaf can scarcely be discovered over wide tracts of the lava plains, yet flocks of goats, together with a few cows, contrive to exist. It rains very seldom, but during a short portion of the year heavy torrents fall, and immediately afterwards a light vegetation springs out of every crevice. This soon withers, and upon such naturally formed hay the animals live. It had not now rained for an entire year. When the island was discovered, the immediate neighborhood of Porto Praia was clothed with trees, the reckless destruction of which has cost here, as at St. Helena, and at some of the Canary Islands, almost entire sterility. The broad, flat-bottomed valleys, many of which serve during a few days only in the season as water courses, are clothed with thickets of leafless bushes. Few living creatures inhabit these valleys. The commonest bird is a kingfisher, which tamely sits on the branches of the castor oil plant, and thence darts on grass hoppers and lizards. It is brightly colored, but not so beautiful as the European species, in its flight, manners, and place of habitation which is generally in the driest valley, there is also a wide difference. One day, two of the officers and myself rode to Ribeira Grande, a village a few miles eastward of Porto Praia. Until we reached the valley of St. Martin, the country presented its usual dull brown appearance, but here, a very small rill of water produces a most refreshing margin of luxuriant vegetation. In the course of an hour we arrived at Ribeira Grande and were surprised at the sight of a large ruined fort and cathedral. This little town, before its harbor was filled up, was the principal place in the island, it now presents a melancholy, but very picturesque appearance. Having procured a black padre for a guide, and a Spaniard who had served in the Peninsular War as an interpreter, we visited a collection of buildings, of which an ancient church formed the principal part. It is here the governors and captain generals of the islands have been buried. Some of the tombstones recorded dates of the 16th century. The heraldic ornaments were the only things in this retired place that reminded us of Europe. The church or chapel formed one side of a quadrangle, in the middle of which a large clump of bananas were growing. On another side was a hospital, containing about a dozen miserable-looking inmates. We returned to the Venda to eat our dinners. A considerable number of men, women, and children, all as black as jet, collected to watch us. Our companions were extremely merry, and everything we said or did was followed by their hearty laughter. Before leaving the town we visited the cathedral. It does not appear so rich as the smaller church, but boasts of a little organ, which sent forth singularly inharmonious cries. We presented the black priest with a few shillings, and the Spaniard, patting him on the head, said, with much candor, he thought his color made no great difference. We then returned, as fast as the ponies would go, to Porto Praia. Another day we rode to the village of St. Domingo, situated near the center of the island. On a small plain which we crossed, 
A few stunted acacias were growing, their tops had been bent by the steady trade wind, in a singular manner, some of them even at right angles to their trunks. The direction of the branches was exactly northeast by north, and southwest by south, and these natural veins must indicate the prevailing direction of the force of the trade wind. The traveling had made so little impression on the barren soil, that we here missed our track, and took that to Fuentes. This we did not find out till we arrived there, and we were afterwards glad of our mistake. Fuentes is a pretty village, with a small stream, and everything appeared to prosper well, excepting, indeed, that which ought to do so most its inhabitants. The black children, completely naked, and looking very wretched, were carrying bundles of firewood half as big as their own bodies. Near Fuentes we saw a large flock of guinea fowl probably fifty or sixty in number. They were extremely wary, and could not be approached. They avoided us, like partridges on a rainy day in September, running with their heads cocked up, and if pursued, they readily took to the wing. The scenery of St. Domingo possesses a beauty totally unexpected, from the prevalent gloomy character of the rest of the island. The village is situated at the bottom of a valley, bounded by lofty and jagged walls of stratified lava. The black rocks afford a most striking contrast with the bright green vegetation, which follows the banks of a little stream of clear water. It happened to be a grand feast day, and the village was full of people. On our return we overtook a party of about twenty young black girls, dressed in excellent taste, their black skins and snow-white linen being set off by colored turbans and large shawls. As soon as we approached near, they suddenly all turned round, and covering the path with their shawls, sung with great energy a wild song, beating time with their hands upon their legs. We threw them some vintems, which were received with screams of laughter, and we left them redoubling the noise of their song. One morning the view was singularly clear, the distant mountains being projected with the sharpest outline on a heavy bank of dark blue clouds. Judging from the appearance, and from similar cases in England, I supposed that the air was saturated with moisture. The fact, however, turned out quite the contrary. The hygrometer gave a difference of 29.6 degrees, between the temperature of the air, and the point at which dew was precipitated. This difference was nearly double that which I had observed on the previous mornings. This unusual degree of atmospheric dryness was accompanied by continual flashes of lightning. Is it not an uncommon case, thus to find a remarkable degree of aerial transparency with such a state of weather? Generally the atmosphere is hazy, and this is caused by the falling of impalpably fine dust, which was found to have slightly injured the astronomical instruments. The morning before we anchored at Porto Praia, I collected a little packet of this brown-colored fine dust, which appeared to have been filtered from the wind by the gauze of the vein at the masthead. Mr. Lyell has also given me four packets of dust which fell on a vessel a few hundred miles northward of these islands. Professor Ehrenberg finds that this dust consists in great part of infusoria with siliceous shields, and of the siliceous tissue of plants. In five little packets which I sent him, he has ascertained no less than 67 different organic forms. The infusoria, with the exception of two marine species, are all inhabitants of fresh water. I have found no less than 15 different accounts of dust having fallen on vessels when far out in the Atlantic. From the direction of the wind whenever it has fallen, and from its having always fallen during those months when the harmattan is known to raise clouds of dust high into the atmosphere, we may feel sure that it all comes from Africa. It is, however, a very singular fact, that, Although Professor Ehrenberg knows many species of infusoria peculiar to Africa, he finds none of these in the dust which I sent him. On the other hand, he finds in it two species which hitherto he knows as living only in South America. The dust falls in such quantities as to dirty everything on board, and to hurt people's eyes, vessels even have run on shore owing to the obscurity of the atmosphere. It has often fallen on ships when several hundred, 
and even more than a thousand miles from the coast of Africa, and at points 1600 miles distant in a north and south direction. In some dust which was collected on a vessel 300 miles from the land, I was much surprised to find particles of stone above the thousandth of an inch square, mixed with finer matter. After this fact one need not be surprised at the diffusion of the far lighter and smaller sporules of cryptogamic plants. The geology of this island is the most interesting part of its natural history. On entering the harbor, a perfectly horizontal white band, in the face of the sea cliff, may be seen running for some miles along the coast, and at the height of about 45 feet above the water. Upon examination this white stratum is found to consist of calcareous matter with numerous shells embedded, most or all of which now exist on the neighboring coast. It rests on ancient volcanic rocks, and has been covered by a stream of basalt, which must have entered the sea when the white shelly bed was lying at the bottom. It is interesting to trace the changes produced by the heat of the overlying lava, on the friable mass, which in parts has been converted into a crystalline limestone, and in other parts into a compact spotted stone where the lime has been caught up by the scoriaceous fragments of the lower surface of the stream, it is converted into groups of beautifully radiated fibers resembling aragonite. The beds of lava rise in successive gently sloping planes, towards the interior, whence the deluges of melted stone have originally proceeded. Within historical times, no signs of volcanic activity have, I believe, been manifested in any part of St. Iago. Even the form of a crater can but rarely be discovered on the summits of the many red cindery hills, yet the more recent streams can be distinguished on the coast, forming lines of cliffs of less height, but stretching out in advance of those belonging to an older series, the height of the cliffs thus affording a rude measure of the age of the streams. During our stay, I observed the habits of some marine animals. A large aplysia is very common. This sea slug is about five inches long, and is of a dirty yellowish color veined with purple. On each side of the lower surface, or foot, there is a broad membrane, which appears sometimes to act as a ventilator, in causing a current of water to flow over the dorsal bronchia or lungs. It feeds on the delicate seaweeds which grow among the stones in muddy and shallow water, and I found in its stomach several small pebbles, as in the gizzard of a bird. This slug, when disturbed, emits a very fine purplish-red fluid, which stains the water for the space of a foot around. Besides this means of defense, an acrid secretion, which is spread over its body, causes a sharp, stinging sensation, similar to that produced by the physical alia or Portuguese man of war. I was much interested, on several occasions, by watching the habits of an octopus, or cuttlefish. Although common in the pools of water left by the retiring tide, these animals were not easily caught. By means of their long arms and suckers, they could drag their bodies into very narrow crevices, and when thus fixed, it required great force to remove them. At other times they darted tail first, with the rapidity of an arrow, from one side of the pool to the other, at the same instant discoloring the water with a dark chestnut brown ink. These animals also escape detection by a very extraordinary, chameleon-like power of changing their color. They appear to vary their tints according to the nature of the ground over which they pass, when in deep water, their general shade was brownish purple, but when placed on the land, or in shallow water, this dark tint changed into one of a yellowish green. The color, examined more carefully, was a French gray, with numerous minute spots of bright yellow, the former of these varied in intensity, the latter entirely disappeared and appeared again by turns. These changes were effected in such a manner, that clouds, varying in tint between a hyacinth red and a chestnut brown, were continually passing over the body. Any part, being subjected to a slight shock of galvanism, became almost black, a similar effect, but in a less degree, was produced by scratching the skin with a needle. These clouds, or blushes as they may be called, are said to be produced by the alternate expansion and contraction of minute vesicles containing variously colored fluids. 
This cuttlefish displayed its chameleon-like power both during the act of swimming and whilst remaining stationary at the bottom. I was much amused by the various arts to escape detection used by one individual, which seemed fully aware that I was watching it. Remaining for a time motionless, it would then stealthily advance an inch or two, like a cat after a mouse, sometimes changing its color, it thus proceeded, till having gained a deeper part, it darted away, leaving a dusky train of ink to hide the hole into which it had crawled. While looking for marine animals, with my head about two feet above the rocky shore, I was more than once saluted by a jet of water, accompanied by a slight grating noise. At first I could not think what it was, but afterwards I found out that it was this cuttlefish, which, though concealed in a hole, thus often led me to its discovery. That it possesses the power of ejecting water there is no doubt, and it appeared to me that it could certainly take good aim by directing the tube or siphon on the underside of its body. From the difficulty which these animals have in carrying their heads, they cannot crawl with ease when placed on the ground. I observed that one which I kept in the cabin was slightly phosphorescent in the dark. St. Paul's Rock South in crossing the Atlantic we hove to during the morning of February 16, close to the island of St. Paul. This cluster of rocks is situated in 0 degrees 58 minutes north latitude, and 29 degrees 15 minutes west longitude. It is 540 miles distant from the coast of America and 350 from the island of Fernando Naranja. The highest point is only 50 feet above the level of the sea, and the entire circumference is under three quarters of a mile. This small point rises abruptly out of the depths of the ocean. Its mineralogical constitution is not simple, in some parts the rock is of a churdy, in others of a felspathic nature, including thin veins of serpentine. It is a remarkable fact that all the many small islands, lying far from any continent, in the Pacific, Indian, and Atlantic Oceans, with the exception of the Seychelles and this little point of rock, are, I believe, composed either of coral or of erupted matter. The volcanic nature of these oceanic islands is evidently an extension of that law, and the effect of those same causes, whether chemical or mechanical, from which it results that a vast majority of the volcanoes now in action stand either near sea coasts or as islands in the midst of the sea. The rocks of St. Paul appear from a distance of a brilliantly white color. This is partly owing to the dung of a vast multitude of seafowl, and partly to a coating of a hard glossy substance with a pearly luster, which is intimately united to the surface of the rocks. This, when examined with a lens, is found to consist of numerous exceedingly thin layers, its total thickness being about the tenth of an inch. It contains much animal matter, and its origin, no doubt, is due to the action of the rain or spray on the bird's dung. Below some small masses of guano at ascension, and on the abrol Haas islets, I found certain stalactitic branching bodies, formed apparently in the same manner as the thin white coating on these rocks. The branching bodies so closely resembled in general appearance certain nullipori, a family of hard calcareous sea plants, that in lately looking hastily over my collection I did not perceive the difference. The globular extremities of the branches are of a pearly texture, like the enamel of teeth, but so hard as just to scratch plate glass. I may here mention, that on a part of the coast of Ascension, where there is a vast accumulation of shelly sand, an incrustation is deposited on the tidal rocks by the water of the sea, resembling, as represented in the woodcut, certain cryptogamic plants often seen on damp walls. The surface of the fronds is beautifully glossy, and those parts formed where fully exposed to the light are of a jet black color, but those shaded under ledges are only gray. I have shown specimens of this incrustation to several geologists, and they all thought that they were of volcanic or igneous origin. In its hardness and translucency in its polish, equal to that of the finest oliva shell in the bad smell given out, and loss of color under the blowpipe it shows a close similarity with living sea shells. Moreover, in sea shells, it is known that the parts habitually covered and shaded by the mantle of the animal, are of a paler color than those fully exposed to the light, 
just as is the case with this incrustation. When we remember that lime, either as a phosphate or carbonate, enters into the composition of the hard parts, such as bones and shells, of all living animals, it is an interesting physiological fact to find substances harder than the enamel of teeth, and colored surfaces as well polished as those of a fresh shell, reformed through inorganic means from dead organic matter mocking, also, in shape, some of the lower vegetable productions. We found on St. Paul's only two kinds of birds the booby and the nada. The former is a species of gannet, and the latter a tern. Both are of a tame and stupid disposition, and are so unaccustomed to visitors, that I could have killed any number of them with my geological hammer. The booby lays her eggs on the bare rock, but the tern makes a very simple nest with seaweed. By the side of many of these nests a small flying fish was placed, which I suppose, had been brought by the male bird for its partner. It was amusing to watch how quickly a large and active crab, Graspus, which inhabits the crevices of the rock, stole the fish from the side of the nest, as soon as we had disturbed the parent birds. Sir West Simons, one of the few persons who have landed here, informs me that he saw the crabs dragging even the young birds out of their nests, and devouring them. Not a single plant, not even a lichen, grows on this islet, yet it is inhabited by several insects and spiders. The following list completes, I believe, the terrestrial fauna, a fly living on the booby, and a tick which must have come here as a parasite on the birds, a small brown moth, belonging to a genus that feeds on feathers, a beetle and a wood louse from beneath the dung, and lastly, numerous spiders, which I suppose prey on these small attendants and scavengers of the waterfowl. The often repeated description of the stately palm and other noble tropical plants, then birds, and lastly man, taking possession of the coral islets as soon as formed, in the Pacific, is probably not correct, I fear it destroys the poetry of this story that feather and dirt feeding and parasitic insects and spiders should be the first inhabitants of newly formed oceanic land. The smallest rock in the tropical seas, by giving a foundation for the growth of innumerable kinds of seaweed and compound animals, supports likewise a large number of fish. The sharks and the seamen in the boats maintained a constant struggle which should secure the greater share of the prey caught by the fishing lines. I have heard that a rock near the Bermudas, lying many miles out at sea, and at a considerable depth, was first discovered by the circumstance of fish having been observed in the neighborhood. Fernando Noronha, February 20th, as far as I was enabled to observe, during the few hours we stayed at this place, the constitution of the island is volcanic, but probably not of a recent date. The most remarkable feature is a conical hill, about 1,000 feet high, the upper part of which is exceedingly steep, and on one side overhangs its base. The rock is phonolite, and is divided into irregular columns. On viewing one of these isolated masses, at first one is inclined to believe that it has been suddenly pushed up in a semi-fluid state. At St. Helena, however, I ascertained that some pinnacles, of a nearly similar figure and constitution, had been formed by the injection of melted rock into yielding strata, which thus had formed the molds for these gigantic obelisks. The whole island is covered with wood, but from the dryness of the climate there is no appearance of luxuriance. Halfway up the mountain, some great masses of the columnar rock, shaded by laurel-like trees, and ornamented by others covered with fine pink flowers but without a single leaf, gave a pleasing effect to the nearer parts of the scenery. Bahia, or San Salvador. Brazil, February 29th, the day has passed delightfully. Delight itself, however, is a weak term to express the feelings of a naturalist who, for the first time, has wandered by himself in a Brazilian forest. The elegance of the grasses, the novelty of the parasitical plants, the beauty of the flowers, the glossy green of the foliage, but above all the general luxuriance of the vegetation, filled me with admiration. A most paradoxical mixture of sound and silence pervades the shady parts of the wood. The noise from the insects is so loud, 
that it may be heard even in a vessel anchored several hundred yards from the shore, yet within the recesses of the forest a universal silence appears to reign. To a person fond of natural history, such a day as this brings with it a deeper pleasure than he can ever hope to experience again. After wandering about for some hours, I returned to the landing place, but, before reaching it, I was overtaken by a tropical storm. I tried to find shelter under a tree, which was so thick that it would never have been penetrated by common English rain, but here, in a couple of minutes, a little torrent flowed down the trunk. It is to this violence of the rain that we must attribute the verdure at the bottom of the thickest woods, if the showers were like those of a colder climate, the greater part would be absorbed or evaporated before it reached the ground. I will not at present attempt to describe the gaudy scenery of this noble bay, because, in our homeward voyage, we called here a second time, and I shall then have occasion to remark on it. Along the whole coast of Brazil, for a length of at least 2,000 miles, and certainly for a considerable space inland, wherever solid rock occurs, it belongs to a granitic formation. The circumstance of this enormous area being constituted of materials which most geologists believe to have been crystallized when heated under pressure, gives rise to many curious reflections. Was this effect produced beneath the depths of a profound ocean? Or did a covering of strata formerly extend over it, which has since been removed? Can we believe that any power, acting for a time short of infinity, could have denuded the granite over so many thousand square leagues? On a point not far from the city, where a rivulet entered the sea, I observed a fact connected with a subject discussed by Humboldt. At the cataracts of the great rivers Orinoco, Nile, and Congo, the cyanitic rocks are coated by a black substance, appearing as if they had been polished with plumbago. The layer is of extreme thinness, and on analysis by Berzelius it was found to consist of the oxides of manganese and iron. In the Orinoco it occurs on the rocks periodically washed by the floods, and in those parts alone where the stream is rapid, or, as the Indians say, the rocks are black where the waters are white. Here the coating is of a rich brown instead of a black color, and seems to be composed of ferruginous matter alone. Hand specimens fail to give a just idea of these brown burnished stones which glitter in the sun's rays. They occur only within the limits of the tidal waves, and as the rivulet slowly trickles down, the surf must supply the polishing power of the cataracts and the great rivers. In like manner, the rise and fall of the tide probably answer to the periodical inundations, and thus the same effects are produced under apparently different but really similar circumstances. The origin, however, of these coatings of metallic oxides, which seem as if cemented to the rocks, is not understood, and no reason, I believe, can be assigned for their thickness remaining the same. One day I was amused by watching the habits of the Diodon antinatus, which was caught swimming near the shore. This fish, with its flabby skin, is well known to possess the singular power of distending itself into a nearly spherical form. After having been taken out of water for a short time, and then again immersed in it, a considerable quantity both of water and air is absorbed by the mouth, and perhaps likewise by the bronchial orifices. This process is effected by two methods, the air is swallowed, and is then forced into the cavity of the body, its return being prevented by a muscular contraction which is externally visible, but the water enters in a gentle stream through the mouth, which is kept wide open and motionless, this latter action must, therefore, depend on suction. The skin about the abdomen is much looser than that on the back, hence, during the inflation, the lower surface becomes far more distended than the upper, and the fish, in consequence, floats with its back downwards. Cuvier doubts whether the diadon in this position is able to swim, but not only can it thus move forward in a straight line, but it can turn round to either side. This latter movement is effected solely by the aid of the pectoral fins, the tail being collapsed, and not used. From the body being buoyed up with so much air, the bronchial openings are out of water, but a stream drawn in by the mouth constantly flows through them. The fish, 
having remained in this distended state for a short time, generally expelled the air and water with considerable force from the bronchial apertures and mouth. It could emit, at will, a certain portion of the water, and it appears, therefore, probable that this fluid is taken in partly for the sake of regulating its specific gravity. This diadon possessed several means of defense. It could give a severe bite, and could eject water from its mouth to some distance, at the same time making a curious noise by the movement of its jaws. By the inflation of its body, the papillae, with which the skin is covered, become erect and pointed. But the most curious circumstance is, that it secretes from the skin of its belly, when handled, a most beautiful carmine red fibrous matter which stains ivory and paper in so permanent a manner that the tint is retained with all its brightness to the present day, I am quite ignorant of the nature and use of this secretion. I have heard from Dr. Allen of Forres, that he has frequently found a diadon, floating alive and distended, in the stomach of the shark, and that on several occasions he has known it eat its way, not only through the coats of the stomach, but through the sides of the monster, which has thus been killed. Who would ever have imagined that a little soft fish could have destroyed the great and savage shark? March 18th, we sailed from Bahia. A few days afterwards, when not far distant from the Abrol Haas Islets, my attention was called to a reddish-brown appearance in the sea. The whole surface of the water, as it appeared under a weak lens, seemed as if covered by chopped bits of hay, with their ends jagged. These are minute cylindrical confervi, in bundles or rafts of from 20 to 60 in each. Mr. Berkeley informs me that they are the same species with that found over large spaces in the Red Sea, and whence its name of Red Sea is derived. Their numbers must be infinite, the ship passed through several bands of them, one of which was about 10 yards wide, and, judging from the mud-like color of the water, at least two and a half miles long. In almost every long voyage some account is given of these confervi. They appear especially common in the sea near Australia, and off Cape Leowin I found an allied but smaller and apparently different species. Captain Cook, in his third voyage, remarks, that the sailors gave to this appearance the name of sea sawdust. Near Keeling Atoll, in the Indian Ocean, I observed many little masses of confervi a few inches square consisting of long cylindrical threads of excessive thinness, so as to be barely visible to the naked eye, mingled with other rather larger bodies, finely conical at both ends. Two of these are shown in the woodcut united together. They vary in length from 0.04 to 0.06, and even to 0.08 of an inch in length, and in diameter from 0.006 to 0.008 of an inch. Near one extremity of the cylindrical part, a green septum, formed of granular matter, and thickest in the middle, may generally be seen. This, I believe, is the bottom of a most delicate, colorless sac, composed of a pulpy substance, which lines the exterior case, but does not extend within the extreme conical points. In some specimens, small but perfect spheres of brownish granular matter supplied the places of the septa and I observed the curious process by which they were produced. The pulpy matter of the internal coating suddenly grouped itself into lines, some of which assumed a form radiating from a common center, it then continued, with an irregular and rapid movement, to contract itself, so that in the course of a second the whole was united into a perfect little sphere, which occupied the position of the septum at one end of the now quite hollow case. The formation of the granular sphere was hastened by any accidental injury. I may add, that frequently a pair of these bodies were attached to each other, as represented above, cone beside cone, at that end where the septum occurs. I will add here a few other observations connected with the discoloration of the sea from organic causes. On the coast of Chile, a few leagues north of Concepcion, the beagle one day passed through great bands of muddy water, exactly like that of a swollen river, and again, a degree south of Valparaiso, when 50 miles from the land, the same appearance was still more extensive. Some of the water placed in a glass was of a pale reddish tint, and, examined under a microscope, 
was seen to swarm with minute animalcule darting about, and often exploding. Their shape is oval, and contracted in the middle by a ring of vibrating curved cilia. It was, however, very difficult to examine them with care, for almost the instant motion ceased, even while crossing the field of vision, their bodies burst. Sometimes both ends burst at once, sometimes only one, and a quantity of coarse, brownish, granular matter was ejected. The animal an instant before bursting expanded to half again its natural size, and the explosion took place about 15 seconds after the rapid progressive motion had ceased, in a few cases it was preceded for a short interval by a rotatory movement on the longer axis. About two minutes after any number were isolated in a drop of water, they thus perished. The animals move with the narrow apex forwards, by the aid of their vibratory cilia, and generally by rapid starts. They are exceedingly minute, and quite invisible to the naked eye, only covering a space equal to the square of the thousandth of an inch. Their numbers were infinite, for the smallest drop of water which I could remove contained very many. In one day we passed through two spaces of water thus stained, one of which alone must have extended over several square miles. What incalculable numbers of these microscopical animals! The color of the water, as seen at some distance, was like that of a river which has flowed through a red clay district, but under the shade of the vessel's side it was quite as dark as chocolate. The line where the red and blue water joined was distinctly defined. The weather for some days previously had been calm, and the ocean abounded, to an unusual degree, with living creatures. In the sea around Tierra del Fuego, and at no great distance from the land, I have seen narrow lines of water of a bright red color, from the number of crustacea, which somewhat resemble and form large prawns. The sealers call them whale food. Whether whales feed on them I do not know but terns, cormorants, and immense herds of great unwieldy seals derive, on some parts of the coast, their chief sustenance from these swimming crabs. Seamen invariably attribute the discoloration of the water to spawn, but I found this to be the case only on one occasion. At the distance of several leagues from the archipelago of the Galapagos, the ship sailed through three strips of a dark yellowish, or mud-like water, these strips were some miles long but only a few yards wide, and they were separated from the surrounding water by a sinuous yet distinct margin. The color was caused by little gelatinous balls, about the fifth of an inch in diameter, in which numerous minute spherical ovules were embedded, they were of two distinct kinds, one being of a reddish color and of a different shape from the other. I cannot form a conjecture as to what two kinds of animals these belonged. Captain Colnett remarks, that this appearance is very common among the Galapagos Islands, and that the directions of the bands indicate that of the currents, in the described case, however, the line was caused by the wind. The only other appearance which I have to notice, is a thin oily coat on the water which displays iridescent colors. I saw a considerable tract of the ocean thus covered on the coast of Brazil, the seamen attributed it to the putrefying carcass of some whale which probably was floating at no great distance. I do not here mention the minute gelatinous particles, hereafter to be referred to, which are frequently dispersed throughout the water, for they are not sufficiently abundant to create any change of color. There are two circumstances in the above accounts which appear remarkable, first, how do the various bodies which form the bands with defined edges keep together? In the case of the prawn-like crabs, their movements were as co-instantaneous as in a regiment of soldiers, but this cannot happen from anything like voluntary action with the ovules, or the confervi, nor is it probable among the infusoria. Secondly, what causes the length and narrowness of the bands? The appearance so much resembles that which may be seen in every torrent, where the stream uncoils into long streaks the froth collected in the eddies, that I must attribute the effect to a similar action either of the currents of the air or sea. Under this supposition we must believe that the various organized bodies are produced in certain favorable places, and are thence removed by the set of either wind or water. I confess, however, 
there is a very great difficulty in imagining any one spot to be the birthplace of the millions of millions of animalcule and confervi, for whence come the germs at such points, the parent bodies having been distributed by the winds and waves over the immense ocean. But on no other hypothesis can I understand their linear grouping. I may add that Scoresby remarks that green water abounding with pelagic animals is invariably found in a certain part of the Arctic Sea. I must take this opportunity of acknowledging the great kindness with which this illustrious naturalist has examined many of my specimens. I have sent, June, 1845, a full account of the falling of this dust to the Geological Society. Mr. Horner and Sir David Brewster have described, Philosophical Transactions, 1836, a singular artificial substance resembling shell. It is deposited in fine, transparent, highly polished, brown-colored laminae, possessing peculiar optical properties, on the inside of a vessel, in which cloth, first prepared with glue and then with lime, is made to revolve rapidly in water. It is much softer, more transparent, and contains more animal matter, than the natural incrustation at ascension, but we here again see the strong tendency which carbonate of lime and animal matter evince to form a solid substance allied to shell.